All right, so I will um, just get started with introductions here. I want to thank everyone for joining us and again making this transition. My name is Healy Farrington. I'm the Clean Energy Community Coordinator at the Genesee Finger Lakes Regional Planning Council. Today we have a seeker training uh, for communities across particularly working with solar installations. And our training today is a follow-up to a 94C training that we had about two weeks ago. And that session is available on USA's website at USA's New York, which I will put in the chat as well for you if you'd like to review that. Today we have Kathy Spencer from La Bella. You're in, you're in, perfect. I'll talk to you later. As well Bye. as Dwight Kanyak from Nafshuk. And today we have to thank, of course, USA's United Solar Energy Supporters for organizing this fantastic session for us and providing the technical support. And Maz is connecting to audio here. So I will give her just a moment. Maz, we yeah. can hear you. If you'd yeah. like to introduce you, says that'd be lovely. Okay. So sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. This is crazy, but hi, everyone. Thank you and welcome to our uses training um, session. I think this is our second training sessions regarding the laws pertaining to renewable energy projects. I want to introduce you a little bit about talk to you a little bit about uses because some of you may not necessarily be too familiar with what we do, but briefly, we are a nonprofit organization and we started just about a year ago, December of last year to basically help people in the public understand the um, important um, objectives and rationale for large scale solar in New York. Um, we're trying to stay very focused on information and getting the facts out and early on in wherever these projects are being proposed so the people on the ground really understand the opportunities before them and some of the issues that they may have being answered thoroughly and um, so our website uses New York it's usesny.org has lots and lots of information on it so far from what we've collected and um, I want to just share that screen with you in a bit, but it's just a really important reference for everybody on this call. I know there's a lot of municipal leaders here, hopefully, that want to get training on more smaller scale projects, which also entail um, lots of work going on with permitting and legal aspects of, of getting these sites put in the ground successfully that meet community needs. So um, as part of what we're doing is we're also developing, we have these webinars that we've done. I think we've done six, six or seven so far and they're on our, our website. So they're all recorded. We also have a toolbox we're creating specifically geared for municipalities, but also anyone can get um, information by going through the dockets and the information we have so far. And again, we're focused on larger scale um, solar projects, but smaller scale, move in and open doors for larger scale projects. So it's all related. And um, the reason why we're doing this is basically because we care about our communities and we care about our environment and our economic standing for the future. And we really feel these projects have multiple benefits for folks as decision makers. Uh, we're trying to get you the most valuable information possible in a timely manner. So that's the purpose of uses. And you can check out our board of directors. They represent a whole array of folks. Um, here's our website, just so you guys can all see uh, what we're doing with trying to get the information out. COVID is obviously impacting us. So here's our board of directors. We've got a, we've got a really great group of folks that are leading the way to, to really help get the grassroots understanding of what solar means. And, um, they're very committed people and just please go over this and I thank them all for being so helpful and getting us launched and we really want to continue in this effort so we're fundraising right now and hopefully we'll be really successful in that so we can continue doing this work it's really important so um and just getting back to under the webinar section of our um Edu under education in our websites this is where I think people on the call will be really interested 94c was addressed Few weeks back with both Dwight 
uh, Dwight Kenyuk and Kathy Spencer, who are on our team right now, going to discuss discuss Secret. So this is an important webinar that we did in a couple of weeks ago to just to address the large scale projects for both solar and wind that are being addressed with 94C. That's a, a new regulation that came out. So folks can take a look at that webinar and, and hopefully get a lot out of that as well. So with that said, we're gonna be recording this webinar. We have, um, we have training certificates that we're gonna be uh, giving out to folks who ended this session you know, fully and just let us know. We have a list of all of you who joined. So we'll get you out those certificates as well. And raise your hands um, at the end. So we left, hopefully we have like a half hour for question and answer at the end of this session. So at the end of the presentations. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience in getting this technical issue addressed. Thanks, Haley. Thank you, Maz. So yeah, just to um, reconfirm, if you have questions, please add them to the chat and they will be addressed at the end. And if you would like a certificate, please email usesnewyork at gmail.com for your certificate. And Kathy or Dwight, whichever of you is going first, please be free. I think I, think I am up first, so thank you. Um, who's got the presentation to, uh, okay, great. <clears throat> Great. Well, thanks again uh, to USIS for putting on this uh, this webinar. I think USIS is is performing a, a critical function in uh, helping to uh, cite renewable energy projects, um, reaching out to municipalities, helping to uh, provide information through these webinars and its other outreach efforts. It's helping to ensure that the projects that get cited are done. Are done well so that they that they benefit the communities and that they you know address the the issues that the communities have in addition to you know helping the state to achieve its uh, renewable energy goals. Um, I'm from uh, Knopfshaw. We're a small uh, law firm in in Rochester. We focus on environmental energy, land use, and municipal law. And just a, a disclaimer: I'm not providing legal advice and the opinions are my own and not my clients or the firm. So, um, so what I'd like to start with, um, and Kathy's gonna get into a bit of detail on certain aspects of this, is a, what I would say is a high level uh, review of the State Environmental Quality Review Act or SEEKER as it pertains to solar energy permitting and the passage of solar energy laws in municipalities. Um, I think for those who do a lot of seeker work, some of this might be basic, but I think by focusing somewhat on the on the solar projects, I think we can perhaps flush out some uh, issues that that arise uh, with with uh, the solar projects. Seeker is um, in in this instance can be for projects that are up to 20 megawatts and, and theoretically up to 25 megawatts, depending on the approaches the solar developer may take in. Um, inciting their project. Uh, the new 94C regulations do give the option of going to the state level for projects over 20 and require it for over 25 megawatts. So seekers can still be uh, the process used for environmental assessment of some fairly large solar projects. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanna talk about a little about is again, some basics. What's the purpose of Seeker? What, what triggers the Seeker review? Essentially, Seeker is a, an environmental review statute. Um, how does Seeker treat solar typical solar energy projects? What are some of the procedural requirements? And I'm gonna be focusing on the, the front end of the Seeker process, which I think is where most of the, it's the extent to where most of the solar projects will, will fall and proceed through it. Um, the, and this I'll talk about a little bit in a bit. Um, they can go through the more detailed environmental impact study path, but uh, most will be going through the, the front end that I'll be providing an overview of. And then uh, I think what's most important and where um, projects can, you know, if, if there are challenges to projects, um, ensuring the procedures are followed is, 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 is key as far as court review. Um, the, the courts are strict when it comes to the procedural aspects of seeker. And then also that the determination of significance is done with uh, reasoned and uh, 
reasoned um, authority and a reasoned review of the, of the projects. Next slide, please. So first, what, what's the purpose and intent of Seeker? Seeker's been around a while. It was passed in 1975. There have been a few revisions over the years. I think most of the revisions have been done at the DEC level, refining the environmental assessment process. Uh, the regulations are quite detailed. Uh, there's some very good resources, and I'll have the links at the end of the presentation to some of the DEC resources to help municipalities and, and, and uh, project developers navigate the seeker process. It's, it's rather nuanced. I won't be covering every detail that could arise on some of these. Um, the, I would point people toward the Seeker Handbook, which is a, a very good detailed guide of really every step in the Seeker process, including various uh, subtle issues that, that arise over the years. So the, the purpose of Seeker was to ensure that environmental factors were considered in project reviews in addition to the social and economic aspects of most projects. So it's trying to ensure that environmental factors essentially have a seat at the table in the project reviews at the local or the state level, wherever the projects arise. The, the purpose is to inject environmental considerations directly into governmental decision-making. Seeker's a New York state process. Um, so when the federal government's involved in approval, there are some, you know, depending on what the nature of the environmental assessment is done at the federal level, there, there's some, uh, uh, changes to the seeker procedures that apply. Um, seeker is intended to make sure as early as possible that, that there is a uh, determination of whether a detailed environmental impact statement should be prepared for a project. Um, and I think one misconception perhaps that I've seen arise among developers, especially the ones who aren't familiar with some of the New York State procedures, as they come into the state is a seeker is not a permit in and of itself. It is a uh, prerequisite for the permits that you get um, that are necessary for a project to be cited. So it feels like a permit, but it's really part of the permitting process for the, for the other permits that may be necessary for the project. Next slide, please. So what triggers seeker? Well, um, first you need to have an action. And the action is defined in the, in the regulations. And essentially an action is any uh, activities undertaken, funded, or approved by a state or local government, and any planning, policy making, and enactment of laws, rules, and regulations. So if you need a permit from a, you know, for a uh, site plan approval from, from a local board, that triggers seeker. If you get funding from a state, the state government, uh, that triggers seeker. Um, if the government itself is passing a law um, relating to projects and physical activities where it would regulate those activities, that triggers seeker. I think one aspect of the solar law uh, review for seeker is that, and it's something that, that I always have to point out when, when uh, towns are reviewing their you know, changes to their solar law is that you're reviewing seeker from the aspect of the law and how the law will impact it. Even if there's there may be a project in mind when the law is passed, it's not the project that's getting reviewed, it's the law that's getting reviewed. There's sometimes a distinction there. So there's, seeker classifies actions in three ways. One is uh, type one, which are presumed to be more complex, more potentially impactful on the environment. And they're presumed but not required to uh, have an environmental impact statement prepared. Type two are those that are predetermined to be to not have a significant adverse effect on the environment, and they're not subject to further seeker review. So if you're a type two project, you essentially go, you pass through the process once you're classified as that. And then the third, the third action is called unlisted, which is really everything else between type one and type two. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how does the classification of the action impact the, uh, the seeker review? So like I said, if it's not an action, there's no seeker. So there's no, you don't go through the, the process at all. Um, the next step is, well, what type of action is it? If it's on the type two list and 
we'll, we'll show a few of those uh, in a moment. And there's a list of, oh, probably about 40 um, type two actions in the regulations. If, if, the, if the approval or the funding falls within that category, seekers deem complete as soon as that is documented. If the action's on the type one list, which I would say most of the solar projects that are, uh, you know, certainly the community solar on up uh, class size projects, um, those will generally be type one projects because of the acreage involved. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, those type of projects require a full environmental assessment form, which is a, which is a uh, multi-page, many uh, questions that are answered uh, for the approving board, the lead agency to um, assess what the potential impacts of the project are and determine whether or not an environmental impact statement is required. Um, the type one projects also go through what's called a coordinated review. Usually they involve more than one agency. The agencies coordinate review. There's only one seeker review for all the approvals for the projects, um, but the agencies involved in those coordinate that review. So let's say you need a site plan review from a local board, but there's some wetlands and the DEC is involved. So the DEC would be an involved agency. The review would be coordinated um, with DEC. And like I said, type one projects are more likely to require an EIS. And then finally, the unlisted projects, um, they would have a short form EAF. Usually it's only like three or four pages. Um, coordinated review is optional. Um, in that instance, you can have more than one agency go through a seeker review. Usually it's better to coordinate it uh, if there's more than one agency just for simplicity purposes. But, and then just generally speaking, unlisted uh, projects are presumed less likely to require an EIS. Next slide, please. So what are some type two actions that could apply to solar projects? Um, a recent, uh, up update to the regulations in I think it was 2018, carved out certain types of solar energy projects for type two treatment where no further uh, seeker review was necessary. And those are for projects 25 acres or less that are either on closed landfills, on cleaned up brownfield or, or Superfund sites that are located at uh, publicly operated treatment works. Um, on previously industrial zone land or in parking lots and garages. So that carve out was made, I think, partially to incentivize those locations for, for projects. Um, you know, that's those types of, that type of land is often otherwise unutilized. It's already developed. There's presumably really little uh, environmental impact from them. Um, now, not a lot of those projects fall in there. I think there's certainly some that are being done on landfills and brownfields. Um, and then POTWs, but as far as overall megawatts being put there, it's, it's fairly small. Um, the, the other areas um, where type two is determined is installation of solar rays on existing structures like residential or commercial rooftops and such. Those are type twos. Um, solar projects where you would only need a building permit where it's only of a ministerial nature. Uh, those, are, those are type two. From a, from a municipality standpoint, um, if the local boards deem it necessary to pass a moratoria, say on a new solar project, those are type two as well. Those, those don't require a detailed seeker assessment. And then finally, Article 10 in, in the new renewable siting law under 94C, uh, those supersede seeker. So it's not that a detailed environmental review is not done it's not done in those instances pursuant to seekers. So the large solar projects falling there don't follow the seeker procedures. Um, they follow those in Article 10 and 94C, which frankly are at least as detailed as, as seeker is. Next slide, please. So um, type one actions, and you know, these are the ones that require the long EAF. Most of the solar projects that are community solar or larger are going to fall under here. So um, first of all, the first category, this goes to municipal laws. If, you're, if the adoption changes in allowable use within a zoning district affecting more than 25, 25 or more acres, 
that would trigger um, a type one for, for a municipality. If say, uh, especially if you're doing your first solar law, so if solar use is not, was not say identified as an allowable use in a district, that would be a type one. Um, <clears throat> zoning changes at the request of an applicant um, for any action that exceeds a type one threshold. So let's say uh, a, a zoning change for a solar project, you know, a large solar project is requested by a solar developer for the town and they need to change their zoning law or their zoning maps for it, that would be type one. Um, then most solar projects will fall under non-residential projects involving physical alteration of 10 or more acres. Um, and since many of the solar projects are on agricultural use, um, in an ag district uh, exceeding two and a half acres is also a type one project. And then finally, uh, un projects that exceed two and a half acres, let's say, um, within or contiguous to historic buildings or parks are also considered type one actions. So most of the solar projects are gonna be type one. Um, many of the solar laws on the other hand, um, especially once the, especially amendments to existing laws, um, those can often be unlisted, but I think they're often done as type one actions since there's not much additional uh, procedural requirement to do a type one for, for the solar law since there's only one, one agency involved. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanna to briefly touch on, so, if, so most solar projects are gonna be so, type one actions. Many solar law changes are gonna be type one actions. So I wanna just touch on the front end of the, the seeker process, some of the procedural requirements, some of the, you know, the issues that arise in, in the front end. Um, this is not covering every, like I said, nuance that could arise here, but um, we can certainly get into that in the questions if you like. So assuming it's a type one action, the first step the applicant does is pre prepare the full EAF. Kathy's gonna get into a bit of detail on that in, in a moment. Um, full EAFs prepared with the application, it typically gets some review by the, the code enforcement officers and the, the approving boards to ensure completeness. Um, as once the application for the, and the, I guess the other aspect of this is the, the, the full EAF is prepared as part of the initial application for a permit. So let's say you need a site plan approval for a solar project in a local municipality the, and it's the first approval you're seeking. The full EAF would be a comp would accompany that application, and the presence and the completeness of that EAF is part of the completeness determination of the application. Um, that EAF will identify who, where the other involved agencies are for for approvals, whether it's IDAs for pilot agreements, um, county planning agency, county planning boards, the DEC, and such. Those lead agencies, once the application is accepted, are notified to um, by, by the presumed lead agency or the proposed lead agency. Again, let's assume it's the siting, it's the planning board for a site plan approval. That's, that planning board would notify the involved agencies. They have 30 days to um, object to the lead agency status of the planning board. Um, off, often, mo most often, uh, there, there's not an objection to the lead agency. If there is, the DEC resolves who becomes the lead based on various criteria. Um, once that agreement is made, you also generally will get comments on the, the application from those involved agencies at that point in time. Next, the, the reviewing boards with input from the involved agency will, will assess the application, the EAF, and determine whether su sufficient information has been provided for a significance determination. If there hasn't been, then the board can request that in additional information of the applicant. So let's say um, there's mention of an endangered species at the project site, but there hasn't been um, much in the way of uh, detail as far as substantiating where that might be and how the project might impact it. The, the board could go back and request some additional detail on um, once the board deems sufficient information is provided, public hearing may be held. Um, it's optional for seeker. 
it's often required for the underlying permit. So the public hearings that are held are often so serving a dual purpose. Seeker has its own notice requirements for their public hearings. So in setting that public hearing, you should be cognizant of, of the, um, the overlapping notice requirements so they're all met. After the public hearing and, and the, uh, the information is received from other involved agencies and the public and the applicant, the agency doing the lead agency doing the seeker review will make a significance determination. And I'll get into some detail on that in just a moment. Um, in the significance determination, the lead agency goes through EAF parts two and three, which are, help, which are um, questions and checklists that guide the lead agency through making an assessment of the environmental impact or potential environmental impacts of the project. And, it, and the, the outcome from this significance determination is one of two outcomes. One is what's called a positive declaration. And if you're a developer, a positive declaration is really kind of negative. Um, it means you have to go and prepare an environmental impact statement because it's been determined that the project may have a significant adverse impact on the environment. The other potential outcome of this significance determination is a what's called a negative declaration, which if you're a developer is positive. Um, and that, that determined declaration means that the board has found that there is no significant adverse impact uh, from the project. Um, if a neg negative declaration is, is reached, uh, it needs to be documented, needs to be filed with the involved agencies and published in the, the Environmental Notice Bulletin, which is a DEC um, weekly publication of, of significant um, environmental uh, notices in the state. And at that point, the seeker review is complete for that project. So go to the next slide, please. So determining significance, um, the, again, the, the, for the boards, um, it, where it's important for the boards to put and document their, the rationale for their determination of significance it's, is especially with the negative declarations for the projects or for the laws that the municipality municipalities pass. The lead agency has a, an obligation to, to um, take what's called a hard look at the, in the areas of environmental concern that are before them. So they're supposed to look at the public input, look at the application, look at the criteria that, the, that is in the regulations for assessing whether the project may have a significant adverse impact. So the question that, that needs to be documented and the, to it is, may the proposed action have a significant adverse impact on the environment? As I said before, it's a negative declaration if, if it's determined that the project will have no significant adverse impact. If there's even uh, the potential for at least one significant adverse impact, then an environmental impact statement is required and a positive declaration is issued. So again, the in determining significance, the whole action needs to be assessed. The EAF has to be reviewed and, and the involved agencies and public input considered and addressed in, in making the, uh, the reasoned decision. Um, and then in, that, in the documentation for, especially for the negative declarations, because in the instance where there's a positive declaration, a whole new process is triggered as far as documenting uh, the, the process with the environmental impact statement. But for a, a negative declaration, the, and, and it's, the agency needs to identify all the relevant areas of concern, analyze those concerns, and put it in writing. This can largely be done by going through parts two and three of the EAF and, and, and thoroughly documenting uh, the reasoning of, of the board at that point. By doing all this, if there is court challenges and such to the determination, which certainly can happen, I think a lot of projects that are contested or even laws and revisions to laws that are contested, it's often on the seeker review where, where there can be, um, it can be overturned because of the procedural requirements 
and the need for a hard look and a reason, uh, a reason decision making. So next slide, please. And I'm not going to get into the EIS track in detail. This chart, you can pull it up on the DEC website and you can click on it. It's actually pretty helpful. You can click on each box and it provides a lot of detail on there. But what I just talked about now is the, I've got up to the upper right hand corner. So if you issue a, a positive, yeah. positive declaration, triggers a whole yeah. environmental yeah. impact yeah. process and finding yeah. that would be at least one other webinar. So go to the last one. And uh, put a few uh, questions. Is there someone who's on mute? Um, uh, put some resources here again. These are quite helpful. The DEC has put a lot of um, thought into helping municipalities with seeker and providing guidance to them. I go to the handbook very often when a, when a question arises. There's a lot of details on the subtlety, everything from uh, uh, cumulative cumulative review uh, review of cumulative actions. There's a whole host of uh, gray areas of speaker that can be uh, uh, explored through the handbook. Again, the forms are on the DEC website. There's a lot of good help and links there, as well as the regulations and in, in, in procedural aspects to it. So uh, next slide, please. So um, we're going to hold questions till the end after Kathy's session. Um, and Kathy's going to, I think, go into a, a bit more detail on uh, the environmental assessment aspect of the secret process. Thanks for your time. Uh, thanks, Dwight. Um, I'll just jump in and unless Maz or anyone else would like to uh, say anything. Okay. Um, I think we have one person that's not muted. Could everyone just double check and make sure your mics are muted? I'm hearing a little bit of uh, interference. No, it's just playing in the background. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Dwight, for uh, that overview. Um, as I listened to Dwight speak, I, it was really fun for me because I've given the same presentation multiple times. Um, and, you know, I think he did a great job outlining the basics of Seeker. Um, I, some of what I'm going to say may repeat a little bit of that, or, but I'm going to try to just give you more of the practical, uh, you know, how does this really play out? Um, for a solar project and for um, both the town and the and the developer and because I think we have both uh, um, types of people listening in. So um, Haley or um, Eva, can you share my start with my slides? Okay, we'll, we'll just wait for those to come up and, and then I'll get started. No, it's live. It's a Zoom meeting, but they can't see me. I just see them. Okay, great. So, um, like I said, I um, have done a number of these training sessions, and I'm going to skip through a lot of the early slides because Dwight has already covered them. Um, but I did want to... Um, uh, possibly just jump right now to um, the second slide or slide three, Eva, um, if we could get to that. Um, yeah, so these were the, I just wanted to focus a little bit again on um, how Seeker uh, is initiated and who's actually doing what during that time. Um, it's always a little bit crazy for both applicants and town uh, boards to understand uh, often how to how to kick off the seeker process because a lot of things have to happen at once. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize based on what Dwight said, um, really a lot of the early determinations rest with the lead agency. And when I say lead agency, we're just all going to think in our minds, um, for this particular presentation, that is a town board. 
So it's the town board that needs to classify the action as type one, type two, or, or unlisted. Um, it's the type, it's the town board that has to decide from the get go whether the project's even um, subject to seeker. Uh, a really easy rule of thumb is if a town board or a village board has a discretionary decision where they are doing like a site plan approval. Well, at least my process, name's up there. Then that means Identify it's agency. subject to seeker. No, and that, um, and at that point, the uh, town board should start thinking about all the initial steps from um, to, to get seeker off the ground. To and to do that, they have to start. tell the applicant, yeah. yes, we want a seeker, a we want seeker that. documentation you as part of the I site am. plan package. Um, we, uh, there can be some initial consultations with the app. Action, hold on a minute, am I muted? Can everyone hear me? Dwight, can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. You okay. dropped out for a moment, but you're good now. Okay, okay. So um, so there's a lot of times when I'm sitting in my office as an environmental consultant and people come to me and say, well, was it a type one action or is it an unlisted action or is it even subject to seeker? And I can give all kinds of advice to both towns or developers on that question. But in the end, it is gonna be that town board, that lead agency who makes those decisions. So we have a lot of guidance, um, but really it's up to the agency. And, and the agency is um, by deciding what classification of the action um, is also deciding what the process is. Uh, are we using a short environmental assessment form or a long one? Are we coordinating the view with review with the 30 day um, process where we're reaching out to other involved agencies. All of those decisions rest with you town board members who are out there listening. They're, they're your responsibility. Um, and you know, certainly if you've done Seeker, um, you're familiar with what I'm saying. If it's something that hasn't happened a lot in your town and you need uh, some guidance, there's a lot of resources um, for you to get in touch with, uh, including Dwight and myself, and of course, the United Solar Energy Supporter Organization or the Genesee um, Finger Lakes Regional Planning Council. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that, that all those initial actions that have to kind of happen at the same time rest under the decision-making authority of the lead agency. Um, so I'm going now to, um, let's see. Let's go to slide nine, uh, Eva, and we will just go from there uh, with one slide after the other. Um, so the, the slides that I just skipped were all about you know, uh, again, just defining the types of actions, what's a type one, what's a type two. Um, you'll notice from Dwight's presentation, there's all kinds of jargon. Um, we love our jargon under Seeker and, and all the, the, those words like negative declaration and coordinated review and type one and type two. Uh, once you understand the Seeker process, those will be second nature to you, but they can sound very overwhelming. Um, and luckily you'll have these slides to work with from both Dwight and I that kind of lays it out. So you have those definitions. But um, what I wanted to start focusing on were, you know, what are these environmental assessment forms or, you know, we often call them EAF for short. Um, and, uh, how, how are they best filled out? Um, and what I'd like to do throughout my presentation is talk to you about some of the practical experience I've had in my work with solar projects over the last couple of years. Um, as Dwight said, and I would agree with him, uh, most of these projects are gonna be classified as type one actions. 
Um, remember, there are state incentives in play often, in, or really almost in all the projects that come through my office. Um, and when you have the state, any kind of state funding involved, it's usually a type one action. Um, I will also say, uh, based on practical experience, it's very unlikely that any of these projects would go to um, environmental impact statement. So, you know, that's kind of where you fall out in all of this. You, unless it's a really small project, um, it's probably not going to be unlisted. You're going to go for uh, type one um, as a classification and therefore the long EAF or the full, it's called the full EAF um, sometimes will be required. Um, both the long and the short EAF form have three parts. Um, the part one is pretty basic. It's a, uh, it collects information about the project itself and what its environmental setting is, what, what's on the land, how much land, uh, what resources are there. Um, part two is a checklist where potential impacts are identified. And part three is where it's more or less a narrative um, where the, those impacts are evaluated and um, judged to be whether they're whether they uh, classify out as a significant adverse impact that would then go into the impact statement process. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, as Dwight had given uh, in one of his last slides, some of the um, links that, where you can find these forms, both the short and the long EAF forms are electronic forms online. Uh, they didn't used to be, but I think about 10, 12 years ago, they, they are uh, uh, fillable forms that you can find online. I think I have a link further on. Um, uh, uh, the workbooks that Dwight mentioned, um, that is also uh, online. Um, it, it's, a, it's a piece of, it's really, it's almost a, uh, I don't know, it, it's almost like having an entire um, environmental assessment uh, course given to you online. It, they're really helpful for uh, especially town board members when you have to go through and, and try to um, evaluate impacts. Uh, it, these workbooks will say, oh, uh, there's an issue, there may be an impact on wetlands. Okay, well, let, let us tell you what a wetland is. Uh, let us tell you what important functions a wetland does. Let us tell you some of the typical impacts you may see on wetlands. And let us tell you whether, you know, how big an impact would be, um, you know, with some examples. If, you, if you're doing this, it's a relatively small impact. If, it, if you're filling five acres, it's a relatively large impact. So, and then it would go on and, and also suggest mitigation measures. So if there's ever a time when you come across an impact or a resource that you don't feel like you have a good handle on um, with regard to, uh, judging how important an impact will be, I would um, encourage you to go to those workbooks. Uh, you can really learn quite a bit. Um, and the fact that DEC has put it all in writing with that kind of guidance is, is really invaluable. Um, the third resource I want to mention, which we'll take a look at, is the EAF Mapper. Um, it's an application that's online where you can enter your site and almost do like a screening of what important, um, what important resources are gonna uh, show up on that site or are present on that site or that DEC knows about on that site. So we're gonna go through um, these one by one and uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at the top here is the uh, website that I am constantly um, on. Uh, the link is um, the DEC link at the top of the um, slide here. 
And then I have highlighted where you can find the electronic fillable forms in the orange box at the, in the second part of the slide. Uh, next. So this is what the environmental assessment form part one uh, looks like. Uh, this actually happens to be the short form. Um, the short form is only about four pages. The uh, long form, which will be um, applicable to most solar projects is uh, 13 pages. Um, so again, if we are having our theoretical solar project, this form, this part one is filled out by the solar developer. So the, the solar developer is gonna come in, um, give the location of the project and, and a brief description um, and all kinds of information about what's the adjoining land uses, what's the acreage, um, you know, uh, what kind of ground disturbance is involved, um, is it, you know, how does it affect um, utilities or um, hazardous waste sites that may be known in the area. Uh, you know, I'm only showing you part one or the first page of the part one form, um, but that form is to be prepared by the applicant and turned into the town for their review when they get the drawings and the site plan application um, as part of that uh, package. Um, it does say to use, my slide says use the short form whenever possible. Um, I, would not, I would not suggest that for solar projects. It doesn't seem to work out that way. Uh, next screen, next slide, please. Um, so uh, you can see here the nature of the environmental assessment form part two. Now, what, is, what has happened is the site plan applications come in, the town board is reviewing the um, EAF part one, they are getting all the background information, and then they have to answer um, a number of questions about how, how the project is going to impact different resources. Again, like um, wetlands or floodplains or a habitat for, for endangered species or just traffic, um, community character, all of those uh, will be um, presented to the town board in the part two environmental assessment form and some kind of judgment call will be needed on their part to decide how big an impact may occur or if no impact may occur. Um, the long form uh, compared to the one you see in front of you um, is 10 pages long. So um, it's not quite as simple as what you're seeing here with the short form, but I just wanted you to get a sense of, you know, how the checklist works. Um, most of the communities uh, that I work with, um, they are asking Labella to do the parts two and three of the environmental assessment form because they don't feel they have the either the staff or the background knowledge to do it. Um, DEC has stated that uh, it does not have to be an environmental professional filling out these forms. It could be a town board member. Um, but, you know, depending on the importance of the project and uh, the town board's comfort level, I often do see a environmental consultant being brought in for parts two and three. Um, it is the responsibility of the town board to fill this part out. Uh, let's go to part three, the next slide. So as you can see here um, on this slide, part three is really a narrative um, where you are supposed to, the town board is supposed to look at the impact that it checked as um, potentially moderately significant or uh, large significance on part two and write a narrative about um, how to evaluate the significance of each of those impacts and whether they actually, if any of them fall out as a significant adverse impact, that can be determined in this narrative 
and that and then that um, leads to the decision of whether an impact statement is prepared or not. Um, often in this part of the environmental assessment form, we try to uh, put in some some documentation to show if we if we dis if we have um, judged an impact to be small or not uh, not at all. We we put some justification of that in this write up. Uh, for example, if we already know we have a sign off letter from SHPO, um, we don't have to go into the uh, you know every detail, but we just say there's no impact on um, historic resources. See attached SHPO no effect letter. Uh, just to document um, all the things that were considered in making the determination. Um, and using the parts one, two, and three of the environmental assessment form. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention here for consideration for both uh, town boards and developers, um, we have been involved in you know several instances, um, probably not half the time, but you know maybe uh, a quarter or a third of the time, a, t um, a developer or a town board, a developer has asked us to prepare a draft of the parts two and three so that they can present that to the town board for the town board's consideration. So the town board might not necessarily agree with everything that the, the developer's consultant comes up with, but it gives them a starting point to react to and then maybe uh, tweak to make it their own document. Um, the intent of SEEKER is that the uh, town board as lead agency would fill out part two and three, but um, it, it happens somewhat frequently that a draft can be presented to them if the town board is comfortable with that and the developer is comfortable with that. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to just also go back to this environmental assessment mapper. Um, this is a great tool, no matter what you're doing, um, to know about. Uh, there, I have the link um, at the top of the slide. Uh, basically, what you can do is zoom into any part of the state uh, down to the level of seeing uh, tax parcel boundaries. So you can select a parcel um, on a parcel by parcel basis. So um, with the information in the orange box to the right of the slide, um, you select your location by county and town. Um, that will zoom you in. And then you can either draw your project site or you can select a tax parcel. And um, the last step, step three, uh, says create report either for the full form or the short form. And what that does is um, five, Five or six questions are pre-answered for you on the short form, and I think about 17 questions are answered for you on the long form. So what I mean by this is DEC, based on the information they have in their databases, fits information back out to you about that site. Um, it will tell you whether there's endangered species hit on that site or wetlands. Um, or whether there's a sensitive archaeological area. Um, I mean, I have an example in the next slide if we want to go uh, one more. Um, so this, uh, the picture on the left, the, the uh, aerial photo is the Rochester Institute of Technology campus in Rochester. And the parcel that has the green star above it is undeveloped land. Um, so the, the theoretical scenario here is, what if RIT wanted to put a solar array adjacent to their campus on that parcel? Um, if you run, if I, once I put that parcel into the uh, EAF mapper, you can see um, that I got answers to certain questions spit back out at me. Um, this was just for the short form um, about what is present on that site. So right from the get-go, I know there's no, no state critical environmental areas. 
there's no historic resources. There is a possibility that there's sensitive archeological um, resources on that site. There are some kind of wetlands or other water bodies that are regulated. No endangered species. Yes, it's in a floodplain and no, there's no um, DEC listed remediation sites um, on or nearby that property. So for both you developers or town board members, if you ever wanna get the sense of what DEC knows about a certain parcel in your town or a town you're looking at, you can run the EAF mapper as, as a screening tool to get you some basic information about what you might be working with. Um, I would also, in our common practice is when we fill out an environmental assessment form part one, we always uh, attach this um, environmental mapper summary report so that the town board can either double check our answers or if we had more information to explain why um, a yes answer is, is not um, quite applicable to the site, then you know, we should document that. Anything that doesn't match between the summary report and the report and the part one EAF should be explained somewhere. So helpful tool to just keep in mind. Uh, next slide. Um, again, this is where, this is a uh, look at links where you can find um, the workbook information. Um, uh, the third resource that I wanted to go over, I think I gave you a pretty good sense of um, how important the workbooks can be. Um, but basically, for any question, if you're, depending on which part of the form you're working on, you can go through this link and get more workbook information by clicking um, on the correct box in, in the orange highlighted area here uh, to find more information about the question you're trying to um, answer. And it, the, again, these workbooks are a great help because they give you some examples um, you know, they can help you judge if an impact is small, moderate, or large. Next slide. Um, I just, uh, I, I think here I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about what was particular to solar projects. I, Dwight gave us a good overview of my first bullet point there, so I won't go back into that. Um, I would say that common practice, again, that I've seen in my experience is if a town board is getting a part one EAF from a developer and considers it, um, you know, kind of lean on the information, um, they, as lead agency, they are entitled to ask for additional information um, on areas of particular concern. Uh, that could be something like uh, we, you know, you, the EAF doesn't talk about decommissioning, please give us your decommissioning uh, plan, or we need to know more about battery storage, um, or we're really concerned about visual impacts, so we'd like a separate uh, landscaping plan. Just like, um, town boards come back or planning boards come back when they're doing site plan review, um, there can be requests for additional information on topics raised in the environmental assessment form. And there's usually a very, um, uh, you know, polite back and forth between the town and the developer to get the information the town needs in order to fill out the part two and three. Um, I don't want to go into this uh, unless people have questions on it. I'll just raise it because we're about to go into the question session. Um, segmentation under seeker is a is a legal issue that has to be um, watched out for. Uh, you under seeker, you cannot take a large project and 
divided into smaller and smaller pieces so that each piece goes through fairly easily. That's um, not the intention of Seeker. They, the regulations require that the entire action is looked at in full. Um, so there's often times when a developer will have two adjacent solar projects um, because of other considerations, um, but they're in the same town. And there's always the question that should be discussed between the town and the developer about whether these should be treated as one large project under Seeker or two individual projects under Seeker. Um, and there's ways to work around that segmentation issue um, as long as the town and the developer are, are, are fairly um, in agreement about which approach um, is best. The bottom line under Seeker is you, you can't allow segmentation if um, you will be reducing the scale or scope of impacts that will be addressed under Seeker by doing so. So I'll let that one lie. Um, we can get back to that in questions and answers. Um, I think that one more slide maybe, uh, Eva? Yeah, so um, I wanted to get my contact information out to you. Um, I'm just noticing that that's not my cell number. But if you email me, I can get back to you with my cell uh, phone if you have additional questions. Um, and at this point, I am going to turn it back over to Haley and Maz um, and Dwight. I yeah, I see you're unmuted, so we can take some questions. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Dwight, as well. This was hugely informative. I know my notebook is full of notes. <laughs> uh, and again, thank you, you, Sis, for putting on this amazing training session. Once again, providing us a resource that we don't have across the state for this kind of training. Um, does anyone have a question at this time? Sure, I see one just popped into the chat. So how is the lead agency determined if the project, did, project is located in equal parts across multiple jurisdictions? I, I can take a shot at that one. Um, it, I guess it's whoever gets the application first um, is generally the one that will send out the, the lead agency notification if if one municipality wants to do it and it's disputed with the other one eventually it gets decided by the DEC if, if it can't be uh, agreed to amicably um, but essentially somebody needs to assert one of the entities needs to assert lead agency um, it is no hard and fast rule generally it's you know if there's a perceived impact in one municipality more than the other it would tend to go to that one if it went to the DEC level. Um, you know, if there were some significant permits that were beyond the municipalities, you know, a lot of wetlands and such, DEC might step in, but I would say probably not. Um, so it's it's really better better by agreement among the parties. But usually, if it goes to the DEC, it would be, you know, a perception of which municipality was more impacted by the project. Thank you, Dwight. I had a follow-up question I'll, while I'll allow some people time to process and maybe add one or two more to the chat here. Kathy, this is on your last question on segmentation. So if this were to happen, what, and you mentioned the, that the developer and the town would wanna come to an agreement on what would work best for them, what are some considerations that they should be thinking of when they think of what agreement would work best for them? Um, well, typically a town, um, you know, will will have one consideration being the segmentation um, guidance itself. You know, it if um, if a town feels like their secret procedures are, you know, and their uh, tradition has been not to segment anything and they're very concerned about that issue, then, um, you know, they're not going to agree to segmentation. Um, the other, one of the other considerations that happens often, and I would put 
forward as a consideration is sometimes one of the projects, one of the two will take off um, a little quicker than the other. Often I've seen them presented together and then, you know, maybe one's in an agricultural district so it gets slowed down, whereas the other one has less issues and it can proceed, um, you know, more quickly and move ahead. Sometimes the second project um, never comes to fruition if it's the one that has more, uh, more impact or they've discovered now more wetlands than they thought or a really big archeological concern. Um, otherwise, it, you know, I guess it's, a, it's always a tough call and it, it probably lies more in the hands of the municipality, but the developer can come to the municipality and provide its rationale for why it's better to proceed separately or together. Um, Dwight, do you have any other insights on the segmentation question? Yeah, I think, you know, from a municipality standpoint, I've advised generally, you know, if there's two projects, especially two projects, same developer adjoining properties, um, where e even if one is ahead of the other, but the other one I think is understood to be in the pipeline, I've advised that they be combined for seeker review. It, from a legal standpoint, that's a much safer, it's, it's much, it's not subject to being contested. I mean, it, 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 it legally, it's a safer move um, from, and so I've, I've generally looked at that situation where it, I, I would do the two projects together. I mean, if, if the one project is really hypothetical um, and it's nearby, I think, you know, there might be an argument that um, it's, it's, it's not firm enough to, to where you could assess the, the impact of the second one. But I think generally from a municipal standpoint, I would, I would combine the two. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. All right, we had a couple more questions come in. Um, so the first is, would someone be able to provide a sample of a development timeline? And Kathy, I know you did this in the 94C scenario. I don't know if it's something you could quickly speak to at the moment. Um, if not, perhaps it's something we could include in follow-up materials. So um, I'm assuming they mean for a community-sized solar um, undergoing site plan review. Um, so a lot's going on right now. A lot of communities are updating or hoping to update solar laws. Um, a lot of, sometimes the solar projects are coming in with battery storage and communities are scrambling to get up to speed with that as well. So I guess in general, I would say things aren't moving in the quickest, most streamlined way for most of these projects that I'm seeing. Um, if you come in with a uh, site plan application and a part one EAF, um, there's also the um, county uh, consultation that needs to be done and a, um, and a public hearing often that is, that's going to take place. I would say the the quickest that I've seen any of these get done is probably four months. Uh, six months might be more likely. If the community is or the town is has a lot of questions about decommissioning and um, and it takes a while, sometimes I see that issue or battery storage hold things up. Um, while the developer tries to get things together to give back to the community. Um, we could put together a timeline that would be almost like if everything goes as well as possible, here's how quickly you could get it done. Um, knowing that if you're a developer listening, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions from the community and the more prepared you are to answer them, the, fa the faster you'll go through the process. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, um, emphasizing some of what Kathy just said, once you get to a complete application in the site plan review laws, usually, 
there are fixed time frames for review, but it's getting to that complete application. And what I have seen with a lot of smaller projects coming to municipalities is that the, the application requirements just aren't followed or they're or the EAFs are really thin. Um, and so we go back and forth with the developer saying, you know, give us this, give us this, give us this, you know, the, the landowner consent is two years old, you know, does the landowner still consent to this? You know, we don't see the option agreements, we don't see the leases. So, you know, things like that, that raise questions as the municipalities are a gatekeeper to some extent. So it's getting to that complete application, I think is what triggers a more formal timeline. And, you know, read what the application requirements are in the villages, talk to the code enforcement officers, do, do something more than a one hour EAF, um, you know, for the projects that, that helps you get through the process quicker. You know, the, it, a more complete application right up front that doesn't require back and forth with the municipalities and the code enforcement officers and the, you know, the town engineers reviewing the, the in environmental consultants reviewing the projects um, that that will make the timeline shorter and get you on the clock. You, what you <laughs> want to do is get on the clock and the clock is once it's a complete application. That's very true. I completely agree with that, Dwight. And I know I've, uh, you know, to speak from on behalf of developers that I've worked with, they're often in a position where they they have to get to a certain point before they get investor funding or incentives and they, they're trying not to spend too much money on the upfront um, documentation. But I think Dwight's point is um, well taken for developers. You know, you're just, you're just gonna get stuck in kind of a revolving question and answer timeline if you don't put some of the early um, documentation together that the towns are going to want to see. Thank you for that, Dwight and Kathy. And then a follow up to that that I think you both touched on a little bit, but maybe we can just expand on it quickly here. Once the seeker is deemed complete, are the project permits associated issued immediately? And I know you both mentioned the application, but maybe you could just mention a couple other steps to that application process quickly. Well, the short answer is no, um, but you you can't you can't get a permit approved without the seeker being um, re reaching the negative declaration. But there there are more requirements to permit applications than just the environmental review. So that, I think that's the, the short answer. Um, yeah. But the, the seeker is a predicate, to, the seeker is a predicate to getting the permits, but there's each permit has its own other obligations, whether it's, you know, wetlands or site plan review, you know, where it's a lot of it is impacts on adjacent properties that are not, in, not environmental related. There you get into economic impacts and such like that. Um, it's it's not the it's not the end of the line. Thank you. And this next question, I I am having a tiny little bit of a hard time fully understanding if the person who asked it would like to ask Dwight and Kathy and unmute themselves. Sarah, feel free. More yes, thank you. And I, I don't mean to dominate with questions. I just always have so many questions. So thanks to the presenters. Um, but I guess I'm just wondering that often within these uh, applications, developers will indicate, you know, forthcoming studies that they would complete, um, you know, once they move forward in the process. And so if just hypothetically, if if the application were, were deemed complete and the seeker process is complete and they move forward with the project, but then they don't follow through on what they indicated to the lead agency that they would fulfill, is there some sort of recourse there or what, what happens in that scenario? Well, normally, and I'm gonna give this to Dwight, but normally I think you would make those studies conditions of your site plan approval. Is that yep. what you would say, Dwight? Yeah, you don't want to um, you don't want to let go of your, you know, of that authority you have under Seeker. Um, once Seeker is closed, um, 
you know, there's, you don't usually go, you can go back and amend things, but there, there's nothing that's going to trigger it there, you know, so I guess I would make sure any studies that you're still expecting would be um, conditions of your approval. Great, thank you. And if, and if those studies aren't provided or, or some other commitment is not made that's a condition of the approval, um, the project doesn't get its certificate of completion and can't start up. So that's, that's the remedy. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you, Dwight and Kathy. Um, I will let Maz close in just a minute here. Um, I did just want to say that the uh, presentations will be available. This has all been recorded and will be on USA's website. So thank you all. And Maz, please send us off. Oh, yeah. Again, I want to apologize for a slow start today, everyone, but I see we have a lot of participants. We have over 75 people that attended this session. So thank you all. We have many that stuck with it. So please go to our website. It's uses New York, U-S-E-S-N-Y dot org. And that has this presentation will be recorded and uh, allowed for everybody to see it at any time, as well as all of our other presentations. And we will be sending out certificates for uh, completion of this, this session. So for those of you who had stayed on this call, um, we will be sending those out uh, immediately. And then we are here to answer any questions. So please contact us. And um, we're really grateful that you're also interested in, in these projects. Again, solar power is coming to New York. We're all excited about it. I think there's a lot of positives to be gained. There's a lot of great jobs. There's a lot of economic benefits for our towns, our, our schools. And there's also a lot of, of like really great um, inspirational careers that are going to come from this for future generations. So please, let's all like try to figure this out in a way that's responsible and also about the next generation. We're going to figure this out for them as well. So thank you all for attending. Thank you for the great presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the great presentation. <laughs>